homes which children cannot appreciate because they deal with experiences which they are too young to have known. There are no good poems that children appreciate which lose their appeal when they grow up. And I think that's uh, very pertinent to what uh, we're talking about. Uh, and um, I am gonna talk a little bit about um, why I direct a certain subject, how I would approach it for adults versus how I would approach it for children. Because the idea here is that uh, those of you who write for adults might want to try your hand at writing for children, basically spread your wings to a wider audience and vice versa. Uh, children's poets uh, should try to write for adults. Uh, it often doesn't work out. You know, some of my very favorite adult poets, um, when they write for children, you know, they're people who are constantly um, challenging society's norms and talking truth to power. And then when it comes time to write for children, suddenly, you know, they become sentimental and, you know, and I think that's the first mistake most people make when they're trying to transfer. Suddenly they forget what it's like to be a child. Um, you know, you, we have this idea of children, you know, having a happy innocence, um, but children can handle a lot and they deal with a lot of emotions. Um, and I think that uh, that's something to take into account. Um, and by the same token, some of my favorite children's poets, when they try writing for adults, um, suddenly uh, they lose their way. Uh, when we're writing for children, we have to be just as careful in our language, if not more so, uh, than when we're writing for adults. Uh, when I, um, you know, suddenly, uh, oftentimes people think, well, it's easy to write for kids, and they get sloppy in their prosody. Um, but you need to be almost more detail oriented and specific, and it's difficult. Um, you know, I think in the world as we know it now, poets are often marginalized and kept off. You know, if you read, if you're sitting next to somebody in an airplane and you they ask you what you do, you have to think twice before you say, "Well, I'm a poet." <laughs> um, the only thing that's gonna get them to turn around to the other side or you know, faster uh, is if you tell them you write poetry for children. So poets are marginalized, but we get to look down at people who write for children. Uh, and I think that's a symptom of our society, that everything that has to do with children, you know, teachers get, uh, are not paid well, uh, caretakers are not paid well. We devalue what we should be most important. I started out writing for adults, um, and yet when I'm writing for adults, my aim is, what do I want? I want you to, um, to see something as if for the first time, or to get an emotion that you haven't felt before. That's my aim, right? Um, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is get you to see the world as a child might for the first time, learn something new. Uh, it's a little more difficult for children because you don't have the same, uh, you can't use the same illusions. They have, you know, less experience. Um, they deal more in detailed emotions, um, but it's still, um, it's still difficult. So uh, later on in the conversation, we'll talk about poets who are able to bridge that gap. Marilyn is one of them, and when I, I didn't know you would be here, but you are in all my talks. I will tell you that. Uh, I feel like um, a couple of years ago, I gave, uh, I was invited to give a talk on um, on researching biographical history uh, and how I do that in my books, because a lot of them are have history. And I came in, and in the first row center, I looked out, and it was David McCullough. Um, and I said, oh, oh my gosh, there's a little extra time, but he was lovely, he invited me to lunch afterwards. I had not met him before. Uh, so I'm pleased to have you and everyone here. So those people who know my adult work are often surprised I write about for children as well, because my adult work tends to deal with difficult subjects, political subjects. Um, those who know my work know that uh, I was the only white child in a black neighborhood. My father was murdered. Uh, that comes out in my um, 
work often. I write a lot about racial issues. Um, I also, um, in my last book, Sleeping As Fast As I Can, I have to hold it up, that's a prerequisite because I'm a writer, um, which just came out, uh, has a whole section on my mother's um, succumbing to dementia and dying. Uh, so I'm gonna read, I tend to work in series, uh, but I'm gonna read the final poem in that series about my mother. And then I'm gonna read a poem I wrote for teens that focused on a similar idea, but I approached it much differently. So this is called Unveiling. At the university in Tel Aviv, the scientists have printed a miniature human heart, 3D, rapid-sized, but replete, the researcher used her own cells, with blood vessels, mitral valves, ventricles, kava. When my mother's muscle stopped beating, Moments after I gave the surgical center my written non-intervention permission, I became aware for the first time of the warren of the body, its escape routes and artificial enclosures. No soul but soil, my mother taught, and it stuck. Afterlife of neither God nor prayer, but pebble, mud, dirt. And yet, one year to the day, my sister and I gather graveside to recite transliterated the mourner's Kaddish after divesting the monument of its covering cloth. Ritual complete, we fold into vehicles two emergency medical cooler torsos transporting home our holy yet temporary hearts. So that's in my latest book. Um, and you get, I hope, some sense of my mother uh, in it um, and her uh, feelings. Uh, it's a sonnet. I use a lot of uh, Emily Dickinson's slant rhymes. Uh, and I should mention that my book is published by Slant Publishers, also named after Emily. Uh, but you see vessels and muscle and ritual and medical weaving in and out as I do that. Um, now, approaching the subject of temporary life um, and death, and for, for this is a book for teens. Um, the book is called Animals Anonymous, and, um, and this is the mole speaking. The poem is called Holy Moly. And again, moles spend their life mostly underground, uh, as my mother is now, which is how I brought this. So here's the poem, Holy Moly for Teens. Mama fed me earthworms when I was a baby mole. She chopped them, sliced them, diced them, and sometimes she served them whole. But first she said, excuse yourself, give praise, and don't be rude. We're all of us pursuers, and we're all of us pursued. Some days we get to eat, and other days we are the food. I studied hard at school, and I met my mole goals. I furrowed to my burrow, and I dug my mole holes. I grew up happy, healthy, and I got to smell the roses. But Mama served up truth each night right beneath our noses. No one lives forever. Everybody decomposes. So when the earthworms dine on me, dear God, please rest my soul. I don't pretend to understand your ways. I'm just a mole. Anything you tell me to, I'll do without a question. But maybe you won't mind a theological suggestion. Everybody dies. But how about I be the exception? So the theme is similar. Um, for children, I wanted to first uh, obviously add humor. Uh, and so the beat, the rhythmical beat is much tighter and different. The end rhymes, instead of being slanted, are full rhymes. That helps with humor, as does that. Um, we still have the same mother with her 
very earthy um, moments. Um, and, uh, and so I approach that differently. Is that, I have two minutes or is that 10? One minute, okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read a poem, well, I'm gonna read it in my head because it's for very young children. And if we have time later, uh, I'll read an adult poem that uh, attaches to it. But uh, again, as I say, I often write about racial issues uh, in my books for adults. Um, and, uh, and we'll see if I come to that. So when I was writing for young children, I wanted to bring up a similar sense of racial issues. Um, so I wrote a poem uh, called The Zen Zebra. And it goes like this. I ponder one question all day and all night, whether I'm black or whether I'm white. That's it. So that's for very young kids. So um, again, what I'm trying to do is give them something to think about that as very young children, they can, uh, you know, uh, when we bring up racial identities in schools, um, people say, because I write also a lot of uh, narrative books for kids, uh, say, why are you introducing this so young? Kids know all this stuff. They are navigating every day more difficult situations than most adults do. I know what's right, but I want to fit in. How do I get through the day? Um, so when I'm writing for young kids, I'm giving something very simple, a starter thing. Um, and we'll see later, you know, I'll read maybe perhaps at the end a poem that will have the same thought process, but for adults. And now we're going to talk to Jane Yolen. It's always interesting going last. Um, some of what you were going to say, taken away already. Some of uh, the things you were thinking about saying, you want to say even more now. And some of the things that um, you had never even given thought to are now suppressing so hard. You're trying to think, I hadn't thought of this. How can I just talk about it now? Because I haven't given it a lot of thought. So I'm going to kind of make a sort of a mishmash of it all. Um, these are two people who I've known for many years, both as writers and as friends. Um, and we all have in our backgrounds a lot of poetry. We have a lot of books together. If we piled all our books up, you know, they would be up to here. But we don't stop. And the question is often, why don't we stop? Haven't we written enough? Haven't we written everything? that we think is possible to write, whether it's in poetry form, as all three of us do, but also in story form, which all three of us do as well. And the answer is, every day is a new poem. Every day. Whether you've put it down or not, every day is a new poem. Um, I do write a poem a day to about a 1,000 subscribers and send them out. Are they ever going to be published? Some of them may, some of them may not be published. Um, but I find that by writing something every day, a new poem or new poems every day, I'm ready to spend the rest of the day writing, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, like Leslie, I began very young. I um, was the class poet in first grade and second grade and third grade and fourth grade. And I won awards in my schools, in my college, um, was published about the same time um, in the that you were you were first published in my high school and then my college. Um, uh, uh, I went to Smith, I won all their poetry awards. And I still didn't think I was much of a poet because I actually was taught in the classroom at Smith, I won't mention his name, but by a, a well-known poet and everyone else's poetry he praised and mine he ripped apart. So I thought I was terrible. Um, 
years later, I was on a book tour and I, the, the, the bookstore manager said, oh, so-and-so um, sends his regrets that he couldn't be here for your reading. Uh, you were the best poet he ever taught. And I thought, if he had said that to me back at Smith, I would have listened more to him instead of cried. I would have tried harder. So when I talk about poetry, I talk about trying. I talk about where do you go? How far do you, can you get? Can you get further the next time? And I do that with children as well as with adults. The, the thing about poetry is that children grow up with poetry. They grow up being poets. They will, they will say sentences to you when they're very young that make you wonder, why didn't I as a poet come up with that sentence or that idea or that notion or that, that stunning revelation? Well, they are finding words. I already have words. I have to refine them as a poet. Um, I have um, three children and four grandchildren, and everyone's a writer of one kind or another. It's sort of a disease in our family. My brother um, is a writer. Um, my husband is a writer. It goes on and on. We sort of gather ourselves together, but we were all writers from very young. That's because children reading books or reading them or having them read to them are hearing the words, are hearing the notions, but are seeing pictures, either pictures in their books or pictures in their head. And many of us remember the poetry from when we were young. Um, some of them are, are poems that, that, that we read that were nursery rhymes or that we heard. Some of them were songs that we heard. Some of them were poems that we read. It was Brillig and the Slithy Toves, Good Gyre and Jamil and the Wave, all mimsy were the Boar Groves and the Momraths outgrave. I once at Smith College a few years ago was one of the poets who was reading poems that they loved to a, group, a huge group. And I started telling that poem from, just because it's one of the ones that stuck in my brain from the time I was a child. And everybody in the audience spoke it with me because it was their poem too. So we, as adults, remember poems that meant something to us. Um, and we grew up on songs, jingles, poems, picture books. Most picture books are poems, really, in a, in a, in a very true sense. Um, so when I, when I write now, I have my next book of poetry for children is going to be a 150 poem book from Random House of middle grade poems some of which have been published before, some of which were written specifically for the book. And that Random House wanted to do a book of poems for me was astonishing. That they wanted to pay me for it was even more <laughs> astonishing. Um, so I'm going to read one of the poems uh, from that book uh, as my, as my Young, the young poem, it's not very young, but it is middle grade. And it's called Lincoln Wept at Union Station. Lincoln wept at Union Station, viewing bodies in the dawn, trades all stopping, doors yawned open, but the line, the line went on. Roosevelt at Hyde Park Station, waiting for crowds to be gone, waiting for votes of the nation. Train had stopped, but the line went on. MLK Montgomery Station, with folks that he could lean upon, arm in arm past bus it, buses waiting, buses stopped, but the line went on. The arc of justice moves so slowly, as we walk from dusk to dawn, often we see no trains coming, 
but the line, the line goes on. So for me, that's, um, is that a children's poem? For me, it's a children's poem. It rhymes, it's got a very strict rhythm, um, but it's talking about something that's even more elevated. So I think it's a middle grade poem because of that. Um, and then I chose a poem that's an adult poem um, that I wrote as an adult for an adult. Um, and it was only after I decided that this was a poem that I wanted to pair with this other one did I realize they were both about, about American, uh, American um, uh, presidents. This one came from sitting with other writers uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Mystic, Connecticut um, at, a, at a place where we were having lunch and it was under a picture of George Washington. And I called the poem, George on the Wall. He glares at us as we eat that old president whose lies have been erased or left uncounted, who crossed a river that saved our new nation, but he also kept slaves, not even freeing them in his will. We are all in his debt and out of it, but I cannot tell a lie. In my mind, he has compromised, even on the wall. So is that, a, is that an adult poem? Is that a middle grade poem? It could be either, I suppose. And then the third poem I wanted to read because, well, because Yeats, after Dickinson is my favorite poet. So this one is called Slouching Towards Bethlehem to Be. What such night flights prove that we do not need the order, nor the night, nor the light, nor the baby, or even the monster itself to become the horror we fear. It already lives in ourselves, in ourselves needing, wanting that moment, that movement inward when always we have been warned to give outward, not Bethlehem, but elsewhere. Elsewhere can we ever be free to be. And I think that's an adult poem because if you don't know the slouching towards Bethlehem to be born poem, you lose a lot of what I'm saying. But I'm also talking about a lot of other things that I'm hinting at, but not saying straight out. Um, if you say not Bethlehem, but elsewhere, else where can we ever be free to be? That's like a, a mysterious couple of lines that would take longer for me to explain them to a listening child than it took to read or to write them. So for me, the difference between a child's poem and an adult's poem is a difference in, is it speaking to them in a language that they understand? Some adult poems are speaking the language I can't understand. Not that they're speaking it in French or in German, or if it's in English, there are poems that I, even after reading them many, many times over, don't get, or poets I don't get. Um, and yet there are poets like Dickinson who I read and read and read again, and I get something different from the poem each time. I'm not sure when I was young and reading poems like the Jabberwocky that I was parsing them over and over again. I was loving the sound. I was loving the motion. I was loving the movement. I was loving the story being told. And all those things made me memorize the poem. I haven't memorized many poems. 
And when I look back at the poems that I would have liked to have memorized and didn't, I think of that as a lost moment. Um, so that's all I wanted to say before we got to talking amongst ourselves. Thank you, Jane. A couple of things that, um, that came to me while you were speaking is that in a sense, um, what we're having here is a very American based conversation, <laughs> because if you um, in most of the world, uh, well, for instance, Leslie and I had the good fortune to travel together to Israel a few years back. Um, this would have made almost no sense to most of the writers we met and every night we went to dinner with a different um, Israeli writer, uh, because all of their writers write for all ages. It, 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 there's in America, we, we want to specialize everything. You know, you go to the doctor for your right arm versus your left arm. It's a different doctor. Um, and, you know, when we go to school to study poetry, um, you know, you don't study prose and you, you know, we, we like to compartmentalize things. And this is not how it is around the world where um, where poets, you know, I mean, if, if you were to take, say, Ted Hughes as an example, um, if Ted Hughes, uh, most people know um, uh, as Sylvia Platt's husband, okay, but uh, the great English poet laureate, um, if he didn't write his book Crow and his great uh, all his great poems, he would still be well known as a children's poet. He wrote 20, 25 books about poetry for children. Um, and if you read his collected po uh, poems or one of the books, um, they almost have it in kind of an age order and you can see how he plays with language as he goes through. So for those people who are listening in who are thinking, well, maybe of trying a different mode, I would suggest that that's a book to pick up and see somebody who's working through that. Um, and just mentioning Ted Hughes, I have to say Langston Hughes as well, is somebody who throughout his life uh, wrote for children, wrote for adults, uh, didn't seem to think it was any different. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, when you travel, is there any place else where they ask you um, what age you're writing for? Or do you have thoughts on it, either of you? Well, you know, I was when you were talking, I was thinking about um, a wonderful alternative high school here called the Care Center in Holyoke, mm -hmm. which is a high school for pregnant and parenting teens. So they're working on their GED, and yet they are reading. There's a robust poetry program, and they are reading sophisticated poems by poets by like Ross Gay, for example, and um, Terence Hayes was just there, and poems on really difficult subjects written in a very sophisticated way, and there's no differentiation that these are poems for teens. These are poems, these are good poems, and that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the carpent, the, my word went, went away, compartmentalism um, comes from the fact that that um, we're dealing with not just poetry and poets, we're dealing with publishers. Hmm. And the minute you start dealing with publishers, they need, to, they need to break things down so that they can sell them. They can sell them to children's bookstores. They can sell them to, to schools and libraries. They can sell them in adult bookstores. And it's a business to them it's not a business well it's a business to us in that it's nice to get paid occasionally but it's not a business to us in that way it's a it's it's a maybe a busyness for us um so if i'm asked to write a book of middle grade poems i know that my middle grade poems some of them are going to be very directly middle grade meanings fourth, fifth, sixth grade, but I'll get, I'll slide in some seventh, eighth, ninth grade. I'll slide in some adult-ish poems. I mean, the poem I read um, about the line goes on can be read by adults as well as, as, as children. 
could be made into a song, uh, could be um, used to start a novel. Um, uh, um, but, but I chose to put it in that particular um, collection. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, I think it may be very American, but I think more than anything, it's just pushed by the publishers. We're, we're, Rich, we're dealing right. with that. I would actually argue that the mole could be an adult poem. You know, I'm thinking about Muriel Ruckeiser, who has a wonderful ode to the cockroach. And, you know, I mean, rhyming roses with decomposes. I mean, that was just brilliant. I loved that rhyme. Thank you. Or is it, so, you know, I know it's, it's in your book for kids, but I could just see that in an adult literary magazine easily. Yeah, I think uh, since uh, you brought up the idea of publishers, I think that, uh, again, for people who are listening in and have designs on writing, I think one of the differences uh, for me is that um, when I write for adults, I really let the language lead the way entirely. I never know where I'm going to end up. Mm. And when I write for children, I kind of know what I want to do, and then I try to fit it in the container. And I think that's because of publishing. Um, because if you have any hope of publishing a uh, book of children's poetry, the easiest way of doing it, nothing's easy, but it probably um, is for marketing, they want a book on a subject. Right. right. Holidays or a certain person. It's almost impossible to sell a, uh, a book of various poems. For my adult work, I tend to work in series. So my, uh, my latest book uh, is in four section and each section really has a theme and you kind of follow it through but when you're working with adult publishers they don't necessarily they're not asking you for that but children's poetry is so um, my first children's books i had been writing for adults first um, in my mind uh, were all just poetry and then i sent my first prose children's book I sent in as poetry, and when they sent me back the proof, they had uh, turned it into prose. And I called and said, <laughs> no, no, you, you missed the line breaks. And they said, well, uh, it makes a nice story, and I think it'll sell better in prose. Um, and it did. What book was that, Rich? What? What book? Uh, that would have been Grandpa's Gamble, going ways back, well, which Barry Moser illustrated. I um, had a similar thing happen. The similar thing was, uh, was oh, yeah, um, an education publisher took my book, um, uh, Al Moon, and Al Moon is a poem. If you look at it in the book, my book is set down as a poem, but it's a story poem, right? They put it into prose. They, they, they took out the line breaks and then they sent me the finished book and I said excuse me I know you're all English teachers working on this it's a poem well you didn't tell us it was a poem they said I said did you notice the line breaks so, and how did it how was it was well, it was republished, already published it's already it was already published right. they said I said, well, if you're going to republish it, it has to be changed. And they said, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. we, we, won't, we won't use it. Um, it will, it'll, because it would take too many pages. That's I've funny. had a similar experience, but the, the poem stayed, the check stayed a poem, but they arranged the line breaks because of the artwork. You know, in a picture book, you have to have room for the artwork. And so, like, I would get the proofs back, and a line would end with the word the. And I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> if you need to change something, ask me, and I will figure it out. But I, I really could not live with a line that ends with the, unless for some reason I decided to do that. So, um, you know, you just have to be really clear. But, you know, the wonderful thing about picture books and poetry is that they have so many similarities, you know, like the page turn is like a line break or a stanza break. 
So there, there's, you know, the rhythm, the repetition, the imagery, the metaphors, there's, there's just so many similarities. So I always say that poets make the best picture book writers. And I really encourage people who have never thought about writing for children before, if you're writing poetry, to just really try it and see what happens. Leslie, we have enough competition. Um, <laughs> the other, don't the, try, just a, keep The on. other thing is <laughs> that, that, and that I really found out working on this Random House book is that you have to have an arc in a, pic, in, in a book of poems, especially for children. You, you have to have a reason why this poem follows that poem why this poem is the opening poem, that poem is the closing poem in the book. And that became the first thing that I had to think about, is what is the arc? Uh, once I got the arc, then it was easy going. But sometimes you, you pick up books of poems for children that don't have an arc to it. It's just a bunch of poems. And I find that that doesn't serve the child reader the way it should because they should be carried through from mm. one end to the other um, not just higgledy piggledy i think we all do i mean adult poets too i mean i think uh, there's not an adult poet out there who hasn't spread out every poems around their floor and spent days moving this one here and that one there and seeing how this one relates to that i think you know we tend to read things by itself um, but but everything reverberates all, each other folks know that i own an art gallery every time we hang a show it's a dance to see the, the paintings speak to each other in different ways and in different lines um i'm wondering should we take i don't know where we are should we see if there are questions there or should we keep among ourselves okay great Mm -hmm. all right great so i wanted to say something so the the old group the mamas and the papas some of you might know there were four um singers who had beautiful harmonies so they talked about the fifth voice which was the blending of all the four voices together and i've heard it also said the 35th poem so if you have a book of 34 poems the 35th poem is the whole thing so I always mix up this this thing. The sum is greater than the whole of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So that, you know, a book, whether or not it's a themed poetry collection, it, there, there has to be some unifying thread that ties it together, that makes it a, a whole. And the poems talk to each other within. So um, that's something that I always think about when I'm writing a collection, whether it's for adults or for children. I, I think for me, the hardest part is when there's a, a single poem in a collection that you're working on that doesn't fit. Maybe it doesn't fit because it's, it, it's kind of off from the rest of the poems in its mood or in its, in its wordage. And you want, it, you want it to fit and you can't jam it in. What do you do with that, that odd poem that won't go anywhere? Jane, you save it for your next book. You know that. <laughs> Let's start over. Yes. Right around it. Um, so um, I want to get back a little bit to um, writing for, I, well, mostly I just want to read some cool quotes that I came across, <laughs> and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the um, great writers who write for both adults and children, uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer, um, it was a wonderful children's writer. Uh, when he uh, won, what, which prize was a Nobel Prize? I don't remember what uh, prize, but uh, he wrote an essay saying uh, why I began to write for children. And uh, actually, he said there were 500 reasons why I began to write for children, uh, and he gave 10 of them. I'm going to give you three of them because I think it's interesting to hear. Uh, his number one reason was children read books, not reviews. Yeah. And uh, I think that's... Um, Especially not Kirkus reviews. <laughs> and uh, I think that's pertinent for sure, because we all have um, 
you know, as writers, we all have an experience, or at least I remember when my first poetry book was published um, and talking about the odd poem. Uh, you know, I, I remember hiding in the other aisle at the bookstore, you know, in, in town, waiting for somebody to pick it up. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I saw somebody pick up the book and turn to a poem and they started reading. And I saw, and I said, oh my God, no, don't read that poem. That's the worst one in the book. Uh, you know, turn the page, turn the page, you know, I'm saying to myself. And then I said to myself, why the hell did I put it in the book? Um, because you never know where someone is going to open the page to and where they're going to land and what they're going to read before they turn to the back cover and see, oh, look at the awards you got or look who said your book was good. Most people pick it off the shelf, they read it, everything should be your best work. Um, and it's this, and and I learned that really from children uh, because they don't care who did it. The other things uh, Isaac Bashev has said is uh, children still believe in God, the family, angels, devils, witches, goblins, logic, clarity, and punctuation. <laughs> I just love that. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not sure about punctuation. Yeah. <laughs> um, the rest, I think, is and, true. Uh, and here's the last one. Uh, children don't expect their beloved writer to redeem humanity. Young as they are, they know that it is not in his or her power. Only the adults have such childish illusions. Uh, so this gets back, I think, to um, the reason that many poets fail when they're writing for children. Uh, suddenly, they become didactic. Uh, suddenly they feel it's up to them uh, to, you know, uh, to teach the child. Um, and I'll just give you a quick story and then see the microphone. My very first ever children's book um, was called Did You Say Ghosts? It was illustrated by Leonard Baskin. And it started out just as kind of a funny thing I would tell my son when he was uh, young and scared of ghosts. I would put him to bed and he'd say, well, I'm scared of ghosts, uh, you know, don't leave. And I would say, no worry, there's no such thing as ghosts. Uh, they're in your imagination. And then I'd um, leave the room and I'd close the door and I'd call in, besides the witches all scared the ghosts away. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of a fun thing we played uh, that drove my wife crazy. But um, when I wrote that down, I sold it as my very first children's book. And as soon as it was accepted, as soon as I, I felt, oh, I needed to rewrite it uh, before it's published. And I started putting in all sorts of, uh, I, added, I added different monsters into the line saying, um, you know, I added in sibyls and I added in various things trying to teach like Greek history and the line and I put all this in. Um, and my editor kept taking it out and taking it out and saying no, stick to the witches and goblins and ghosts. Um, that was my first picture book and as a little kind of mini brag, which is how I got this story in. Um, most adult poets know that one of the pinnacles of making it is when the New Yorker takes your work. Uh, you, send, you can send your work out to the New Yorker for years and years uh, and not get anything in and usually not here. Um, my very first picture book, they took that and they reviewed that book and they published a part of the poem. So I'm actually a New Yorker poet, but what they said is this book is pure fun. It's nice to see a book that's just poetry and not trying to teach kids anything. Um, so I'm wondering if you can all talk on, because when I do write my books and I write a lot about social justice issues, I am trying to teach kids something. You just have to hide it somehow because the story is paramount. And I'm wondering if you, where the line is for each of you. The line goes on. <laughs> We, I think that you need to let the story be the story, not to bang people over the head with it. Um, I go back over and over things when I'm writing a children's picture book um, because of that, because it's too easy to fall into teacher mode or mommy mode or nana, no, nana mode. Um, 
uh, wait, wait, I need to tell this child something. They need to get this from it. If the story is told beautifully, they're going to get what you're, what you're going after. But that's the same thing with the poem, too. If the poem is a lecture, then just write it as a lecture. Don't write it as a poem. Mm -hmm. What I tell my students is a bell, not a bow. So because usually the quote unquote lesson comes at the end, you know, because the poet thinks, oh, they're not going to get it. So I have to like wrap it up, tie it up neatly with a bow with the message. And instead, I say a bell because a bell rings, a bell reverberates inside the reader. And it's usually, it, you know, and it's very hard to find. But when you get the exact perfect image that you want to end in, that's what the reader walks away with and that carries the message well and of course okay. dickinson said tell all the truth but tell it slant success in circuit lies and i love the way the word lies <laughs> is stuck in there so that you go you're telling the truth but you're lying right well yes that's what writing is it's really we're telling the truth sometimes we tell it straight and sometimes we lie about it but we're getting to it don't hit people over the head with it. If you're writing a poem or you're writing a, a story, don't preach. And bringing up Dickinson is always a good way to turn to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody here have questions in house? Don't be shy. Ooh. <laughs> We had a really great poet yesterday, Enzo Salancer, and who was reading for the festival. And he told, someone asked him when he started writing poetry. And he, he told a story about being a kid and it was raining and he saw water dripping from the trees. And he wondered to himself, are the trees crying because they're sad? Or are they crying for me because I'm sad and I can't cry? And he realized that poetry was sort of this place that he could, he could ask questions that he couldn't ask of people, of adults maybe. So I guess I wonder, do you think about that when you're writing poetry? Um, I guess for kids or, or adult readers, are you thinking about questions that people may have and either not be able to articulate or be too afraid to ask? For now, now I'll come clean, which is really, I don't think about audience when I write poetry at all. You know, I really don't. I think about the audience of one, which is me. And, you know, I started writing poetry when I was a kid because we moved from Brooklyn to Long Island and my grandmother stayed in Brooklyn and I was miserable. I missed my grandmother so much. I missed the city. I hated the suburbs. And I wrote poetry to make myself feel better. I mean, nobody said, you know, why don't you write some poetry? It'll make you feel better. It just was kind of this organic thing that I turn to. So, but I mean, I just love that, you know, a child, how astute to think, are the trees crying because they're sad or because I'm sad? I just think that's an amazing concept for a child to come up with or an adult. And, and I'm going to think about that. So thank you for that question. If, if you talk to a lot of children, whether you're a teacher or a, a poet who goes into the schools or whatever, a lot of them are, are talking in poems without realizing it you want to go and steal some of those lines because the lines are so wonderful but they are seeing they are seeing things sometimes for the first time they are hearing things sometimes for the first time we we as we get older um we've heard all these things before we've heard them from other poets or we've heard them god help us on online or we've heard them um, in somebody else's musical um, things, trying to sell us stuff, um, and and we get a little worn and weary. But when children are coming to poetry and discovering it, they're, it's, it's not that they're telling you a poem; it's they're telling you a truth that they've just discovered. Very often, it sounds like a poem, but it is a truth that they've found, and I think. When I'm writing poetry, if I can get back into that childlike state, I'm better even at writing sophisticated adult poems than I am if I'm going into it saying, I'm going to write the world's best poem now and it's going to be for adults and it doesn't work that way for me. Yeah, um, I, unlike 
my friends here um, did not read as a child uh, and um, uh, did not grow up, uh, you know, well, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to make up for it now. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think I ever saw my dad read a book. My mom did read uh, usually what it was on the, you know, kind of bestseller list or something. So she had books, but I didn't read as a child. Um, I was not read to as a child. Um, when my own children were young, I did not read to them. Um, and I didn't know the world of picture books even existed or children. And that came much later for me. Um, now, when I go into schools, um, and the teacher, you know, asks me when I started reading, and I say, well, the first book I can remember reading, I was a senior in high school, uh, trying to get out, um, and, uh, and that's not the answer they are waiting for, and I tell them that's the perfect answer, because you have a lot of kids in this class who don't read, and you never know where your life is going to take you and what you're going to end up. My teachers would be aghast if they knew that I ended up being a writer. It was, you know, uh, I was not the class poet. I was a class clown. Um, and uh, I created as much havoc as I could. Uh, and uh, I do remember one point in 11th grade, and I don't remember the circumstances, um, writing a poem uh, for one of the assignments and handing it in and my teacher told me my teacher ripped it up and said you can't write a poem until you learn how to behave um however i was saved did you in, ever hear about a lot of these yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so i was saved in 12th grade um by a teacher who said to me the first day i hear you like to cause trouble in the class um and here's the deal uh you can sit in the corner and do whatever you want and promise not to disturb the class. And in exchange, I will give you an A. I thought that was the sweetest deal I could have, I, I could have ever gotten. It? So I went and sat in the corner. But he was a lot smarter than me, um, you know, because I made a deal. And they were reading Crime and Punishment in the class. And he was so amazingly engaged and of course it's about raskolnikov who thinks that he's special and of course i thought i was special um and uh, and little by little i moved my chair closer and closer and closer um and uh, and that's that would that changed my life that was the first um that was my first encounter with literature and uh, you know and a teacher who unfortunately um, would not last a week in the school today. He was also a fairly bad drunk um, and, uh, and ended up taking me to the beach once and reading uh, during my, I had a, uh, uh, I was being held after class and he said, why don't we just go to the beach and read? And he read to me on the beach, one guy, I mean, it was, it, he was great. But then he started drinking um, and drove me home. But he changed my life. And, um, you know, this is not a plug for drinking, <laughs> on the beach, uh, which I don't. But you never know what's going to strike you, when it's going to strike you, and, uh, you know, and, and to be open for it. And after that, I wanted to, I, I was insatiable. This, you know, it's fascinating to hear that because my parents both were writers. My father was a journalist. And all their friends were writers. So my assumption was when you grew up, you were a writer. And so I planned that early on that I was going to be a writer when I grew up uh, and, and became one. But I thought, you know, yes, I knew that there were teachers, librarians, uh, people selling stuff on the streets in New York City and uh, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. But when they went home at night, they wrote. I was pretty <laughs> sure of that. So I was going to have a job somewhere, but at night I was going to write. So I had the experience where I knew I wanted to be a writer, but my parents said, you, you can't make a living as a writer. You have to have a, you know, a plan B. You have to have a day job. And so I thought about Barbara Streisand, 
who did not have a day job. You know, she doesn't know how to type because she said, if I know how to type, I'm going to wind up typing. So I always joke and say, I don't know how to sing because I, if I knew how to sing, I'd wind up singing, which is a real joke because I have no voice. But I just did not, never had a plan B. But I, I'm learning so much, Rich. I was also the class clown and troublemaker. Did you know that? I'm, I was actually voted yeah, the class been, been, wit yeah. of my high school. It's in my yearbook. I was considered and, the, sar the sarcastic one. And Jane, I was also cried after my, at Naropa Institute, you had to have a defense. And my teachers, Allen Ginsberg and Ed Waldman, were so hard on me that, that I cried all night. And years later, they said, you are our best student. That's why we were so hard on you. So we have that in common too. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But if they had told you you were the best student, you would have worked even harder. No, I don't know. I maybe would have had a big swelled head. But I also <laughs> had a wonderful teacher in at the University of Vermont named David Huddle. And I worked really, really hard on a poem. That. And on the bottom, he wrote, so what? And I was like, wow, that's harsh. But you know, I obviously I never forgot that. And I put all my work, whether it's for adults or children, to the so what test. I mean, a poem has to say something, right? So, you know, at the time I was devastated, but when I look back, I'm kind of, I'm grateful, you know, because I, I think about that. That's a tool I have in my toolbox. We have another audience question here, mm -hmm. if you'd be willing ah, to take great. one more. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. And one is, um, I find it very interesting, um, Richard, that you went from being the class clown to being, to writing about very serious topics. And, and same with you, um, uh, Leslie. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to tell this quick story about um, the kids I was working with who were four years old, graduating into kindergarten. And, you know, I did the, oh, well, you know, you'll make new friends at your new school. And I taught them the song, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other is gold. And he goes, which one is silver and which one is gold? <laughs> and I just thought that just what you're saying, Jane, how poetic that is. Like, I never really thought about that. I just teach that song to kids who are, you know, moving on to new <laughs> places. So anyway. There's a lot of Thank stuff you. out there that people write that I don't get. And I think that there are lots of things that I write that people don't get. And then suddenly one day, this is like the light bulb moment. Um, and, and, and I find that more and more with children's books, I will read them. People send, send all of us books to read so that we will, we will give them a, you know, a little promotion line on, you know, to, mm -hmm. on, their, on their books. And sometimes I'll read it and I'll go, I don't get it. What, what can I possibly say about this book? And then weeks later, I go, oh, wait, now I understand it. <laughs> now I'm making, thinking about blurbing a book and writing, I don't get it <laughs> on the back, yeah, yeah. or so what? <laughs> yes, so what? Yes, you, I will never can. do that, but I thought, oh, that, could, that would be interesting. A friend of mine actually published a blurb on the back of his adult book, his first book. He had sent it to um, William Saroyan. Uh, the poet's David Kurdian, who's a great Armenian poet. Uh, and if you look at his first book, uh, Sorayan wrote, uh, there are two wonderful poems in this book. <laughs> and I'm thinking, geez, if I had two wonderful poems in a book, that's not bad. You know, put that on. You know, if, if, if lightning can strike you twice in one book, that's pretty, pretty amazing. One, 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 one hopes it's a little better than that. No, a little better balance. A little less filler. <laughs> my, my, um, my first book that was ever published um, was about Lady Pirates. And Virginia Kirkus said, more swish than swash. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question there? I have a question from our virtual audience. Um, Kate asks, of course, many writers who write towards children feel motivated to make sure their writing is comprehensible to their audience. But I've found everyone, children and adults, are captivated by not knowing, doubt, the lack of understanding, wonder, further exploration, mystery. How do you make space for not knowing in your work, no matter what age range it is directed toward? You never know who your audience is going to be, unless I think you write romance novels, then you have a, a good idea of who your audience is. 
Um, and with children, you don't know. I mean, I, the first book I ever read, read, that means I read the words, right, um, was, was a book um, um, called Joseph in Egypt. It was this thick, and my parents had given me permission to read anything, you know, in their books. I had no idea what was going on, but I read the whole thing. I must have been about five at the time. I agree that uh, that almost all great works of art have something mysterious in it, and that's the only reason that you keep coming back to it. So, uh, and as they say, and I believe it's true, uh, if you know exactly what you're saying in your poem, um, then uh, if, it, if it's not fresh and mysterious to you, then it won't be to the audience, oh. which is why you follow the words where they take you. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, Robert Pinsky often talks about the fact that we love a degree of difficulty. It's why we, you know, I don't, but you know, why people play golf trying to get a ball in this tiny little hole surrounded by fans. Um, you know, we like working towards something. So the poem needs some, some degree of, uh, of mystery, uh, some degree, I mean, in this audience, I'm sure everybody has had the experience of coming back to Emily Dickinson and saying, I've read this poem 100 times, and damn, I never saw that before. And, uh, and one of the reasons that her work, I think, has, you know, uh, is so well regarded and has lasted so long is that that seems to be the more than not. When you read her work, and then you reread it uh, a week later, a year later, wow, I didn't see that. And, you know, and in my best work, sometimes I go back and I read my earlier books and sometimes I say, oh, why did I publish that? And other times I see things that I didn't see before, which is why we can only do as writers, say, half the job. The readers have to come and finish what we're doing. Otherwise, we'd be sitting in our room. Well, Emily sat in her room, um, but she saw well beyond that. Um, otherwise, we'd be talking to ourselves all the time. We want that connection. And, uh, and it's always amazing what people see. Uh, the first book that I mentioned about ghosts, where one monster followed another. I read a review of it once, and they talked about how it was influenced by my adult poetry about the Holocaust. There's always a greater evil, a greater evil. That did not even occur to me, or obviously to the New Yorker reviewer. But um, but. But you say thank I went you. I meant that, right? Hmm? You say thank you. Of course, no. I intended that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had. To, so uh, there's no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Mm -hmm is something that I think about a lot. So I'm also not somebody who outlines or know, you know, I was once saw a panel where one, the question was asked, do you know how the poem ends before you begin? And one writer said, of course, how else would I know where I'm going? And the other writer said, of course not. Why would I write it if I already knew how it was gonna end? So um, for me, the, the, the writing a poem is an act of self-discovery. And I hope that reading the poem is an act of self-discovery for the reader. And I, f I find a lot of the mystery and a, a lot of the places to ponder and go deeper is with metaphor and simile, you know, with those comparisons. If there's something, you know, if there's a spark between two things that I've never thought about before being connected in a certain way, that, that's an interesting mystery to me that I want to pursue. I think the idea of mystery is very important. I think you just nailed it. Because how do you know when you're starting a poem what the last line is going to be unless you're just looking for a rhyme? Um, and even then you can find something mm -hmm. that surprises you. Uh, and, and I find myself sometimes when I'm writing poetry, I get to that last line and I go, oh, wow, how did I get there? And I go back and I reread the poem and I go, oh, yeah, I see now how I got there. But it surprises me. If it surprises me, it's going to surprise my reader. Other question? 
Do we have any final questions in the audience? Yes. We do. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I, I feel like sometimes with um, works, you come back to them and they have so much more meaning. I, I remember reading Blake um, Songs of Innocence and Experience at like 12 and then at 21 and at 35 and, and it has, they, it hits different each time, right? It, 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 you feel it differently and, but the fact that it's sort of been written on your memory also hmm. gives it something as well. well. Blake is a perfect example, yeah. in fact, of somebody, his poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright is in all the children's anthologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can read it as a child, you can read it as a middle schooler, and you come back as an adult, and it's a totally different meeting. I think he's a wonderful yeah. example of somebody yeah. who does that in his poetry. And he was Allen Ginsberg's favorite poet. And Marilyn Nancy, and Nancy Willards as well. Uh, I, I just want to say that, that that seems to me to be true of all literature. There is a lot of literature you can read as a child. Read um, Greek myths, and they mean something to you. They're touching, but then you go back to them 20 years later and realize that they mean something completely different from what you got from them earlier that because you've changed you've deepened and a large part of the reason you've changed as a reader is because of what you read yeah. as a child and i mm. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about frederick cruz's book the Poopler, perplex which offers maybe eight essays about Winnie the Pooh from different mm. critical points of view. There's a Freudian re uh, reading of Winnie the Pooh. There's a Marxist reading of Winnie, Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. They all make sense, um, but they are all completely different from what first readers of, of Winnie the Pooh will get. Yeah. So, um, a, a large part, I think, of the, of the change in the responses is the change in the individuals, the, uh, which, again, children's literature contributes to. Mm -hmm. The other, if, you, if you've never read Chris, Christopher Robin's um, take on Winnie the Pooh, he was horrified. His, by his, what his father had done by taking his childhood from him and turning it into something else. So it's, it's who knows? Sometimes I worry. I've, I've taken some of my children's thoughts or the thoughts of children that I've met and I've turned it into something. And every once in a while that worries me because did, did I ask for permission? Sometimes, most times not. Um, and so when we're writing for children, we have to get back into that childhood. And some of us didn't have very good childhoods, and some of us had wonderful childhoods, and some of us are stealing from our children. Well, thank you all for this conversation. There's been so much to think about. Uh, I'd love a big round of applause from our audience for these poets. Thank you for sharing your passion, your experience with us, and um, inviting us to enter into a new poem every day. For those of us in the audience, um, we have one festival program left, the marathon grand finale, which will be here at the homestead and virtually at 3 p.m. We hope you will join us for this community reading of the final poignant poems written in Emily Dickinson's lifetime. And afterwards, those in Amherst will celebrate with her own coconut cake. So very exciting. Uh, take care and hope to see many of you soon.
sign them. Yes, some of us have brought books along if you wish to, to um, get a book signed.